I'd like to welcome our panelists for the Becoming a Digital Storyteller section. And uh, we have the unique experience of having three people from very different paths of digital, digital storytelling that I think will be of interest. Before we get into that, let's, I'd like to have you uh, meet each one of them, and I'd like them to introduce themselves. And uh, in some cases, they'll have a clip to show you a little bit about their work, and I'll ask them to explain that work in the process. But let's start with Jamie. Jamie, you want to tell a little bit about your work at Hallmark? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Sanchez. I am the uh, director of the multimedia studio for Hallmark Cards. Our studio name is Media Mint. We've named it that just to uh, help warm up the whole, whole description of multimedia with Hallmark. When you say multimedia, we're, we're new enough to the organization. People look at you and, and say, what is that? What do you guys do? What's multimedia? Within Hallmark, we describe multimedia uh, in a variety of ways with character animation, motion design, uh, personalized greetings online. How many of you have gone online and uploaded your photos and made your own greeting cards and sent them to your family? Hallmark has all those capabilities that fall into that multimedia category. And it's been a evolving and growing capability. Uh, we use the term emerging emerging skill sets, emerging products, emerging departments. Uh, that means we're uh, moving quickly to try to keep pace and, and sometimes catch up to where the industry's at. So it's a very exciting time right now for Hallmark. Uh, everyone knows Hallmark for our, what, our paper greeting cards, right? So we really are trying to become known for the uh, online and web and interactive product capabilities. Thank you, Jamie. And we also have with us today Anthony Laddish of Mild Deep Films and TV. Let's see a little of his work, and then I'll have Anthony explain uh, his, what he does and uh, talk about his work. Scene 4-2, take 6. Very interesting. Let's hear, hear more about your work, Anthony. And uh, well, some of what you saw was for love, and some of it was for money. <laughs> um, and that's kind of you know the way that I that I work. I um, I'm a firm believer that there's your work and that there's your life's work. And I've made it my goal to do my life's work and try to do it so well that people seek me out to tell their stories my way. And um, and that's and it's. It's been a pretty amazing couple of years of having that happen. I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago from one of the bigger agencies in town who had a client, and they had seen the piece that I had done on, on um, Hammer Press, uh, Brady Vest, uh, who's a letterpress printer here. And it was just a documentary that I made on my own, just a little six minute short. And uh, that's been one of the best six minutes I've ever, um, <laughs> like the most profitable six minutes I've ever worked for free for on um, <laughs> because it's gotten me a lot of work. But they said, man, this is amazing. We want you to do that kind of storytelling for this other client that we have. And anyway, so those sorts of things, um, when those sorts of things happen, it's just justification and, and um, uh, validation for kind of blazing your own path and doing your own thing. I kind of, my mom always said I marched to my own drummer. And, I'm not good with a boss, generally, so. 
I mean, I like having a different boss every day. That's what I mean. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. We also have with us Bruce Brannett of Brannett FX. Let's look at what some of his work, and we'll have him talk about it and tell about what he does. Keeping me awake It's the house telling you to close your eyes And some days I can't even trust myself It's killing me to see this way Cause though the truth may bury this Ship will carry our bodies safe to the shore So all of that was done for money. <laughs> um, but I want to kind of, uh, I'm Bruce Brannett, and uh, we do visual effects uh, mostly for television, commercials, some feature film work. Um, but uh, echoing kind of what, what Tony said, uh, I kind of have, I wear two hats too, and one of them is to uh, help tell other people's stories, and usually it's five minutes between the rest of the story, but it's an important, or five seconds but it's an important five seconds where it's one shot that needs to get something across. Um, and in doing that, uh, over the course of a year or more of doing things like that, uh, I try and carve out times when I can find the time and the money to tell my own stories uh, using all of these same tools. Um, and I've spent um, nine or ten years in Los Angeles working for most of the clients that I still work for now and I'm lucky enough to be able to have taken a lot of that work back here to be able to do it where I was born and raised. That's terrific. You know, we're going to be talking about becoming a digital storyteller and uh, each of you have an interesting different set of circumstances that brought you to uh, your work in digital storytelling. Jamie, you've been, uh, you've taken the corporate path and have worked within a large creative corporation much of your adult years. I know you pioneered a lot of work at Hallmark. Uh, Bruce, you've taken the entrepreneur's approach and have developed your studios both here and in, in LA. And Tony, you've taken the independent filmmaker path and kind of followed uh, your muse. I'd like to hear each of you tell a little bit about that personal journey that led you to that path and uh, uh, how, how you chose to become a digital storyteller. Well, it's funny that you say because Bruce and I actually had lunch yesterday, and um, I had mentioned something about that, and he wisely put it, and I'm just going to say this for you so that way I get more mic time. You're going to steal my mic. <laughs> um, but, you know, as a, I'm a freelance filmmaker, and as a freelancer, I'm also an entrepreneur as well. So, um, But for me, it was just I wasn't 
I'm not good at anything else. And um, <laughs> I'm a musician, and I've you know been in bands and I've played, but playing music is not a very profitable business to be in necessarily. And all I knew, all I ever wanted to do was tell stories from the time I was a little kid. And and um, and so I just I I happened into this because I this is this is it. Like I'm I'm all in. Like I'm a like push your chips into the middle of the table, and I'm either you know like scruffier and holding a sign or I've got a camera in my hand, so. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, uh, the corporate path, as dry as that may sound, um, <laughs> really. Sorry, man. That's okay. Um, really started, started um, I started at Hallmark, uh, you ready, 30 years ago, <laughs> as an illustrator. So when I started at Hallmark, I stopped telling this story to my young designers that I would hire because it didn't mean anything to them. I was just aging myself. Uh, when I started at Hallmark, we, it was before the digital server-based Mac uh, uh, work process was, was ever uh, uh, initiated. So I, I uh, was hired at Hallmark to do the illustrations for greeting cards. And that whole path has been all about what got me in the doors at Hallmark was, and I've heard this repeated from previous speakers was the uh, basic skills that I had as an artist. The craft of creating with your hands, drawing skills, painting skills, design skills, having those strong foundation skills, ultimately what is what has been at the core of uh, leveraging uh, the tools, the current tools, and all the designers as they do embrace storytelling, whether it's digital storytelling or creating assets for storytelling and, and along the corporate path has been something that just has continued to blossom there at Hallmark. Um, so from 1982 to present day, it has been a, a series of learning curves, passion-led initiatives, a lot of self-teaching as well as uh, seeking out training you have to maintain that level of curiosity that's going to give you that competitive edge. Entrepreneurial spirit is still needed within a corporation. Just because you're in the corporation doesn't mean your work is over. You need to continually uh, recreate yourself. It's very competitive and you need to have that passion to uh, really be successful uh, as an artist, as a designer, as a storyteller. So uh, we, we've made some incredible progress there at Hallmark uh, along the corporate path. But like every corporation, we have the uh, legacy systems. We have the challenges. We have to be very patient. I'm sure my fellow presenters have many people who suddenly become art directors and experts because they're their clients. And guess what? They're right. So that's ongoing, even within our, our own uh, corporation at Hallmark. And you've seen some of the great examples. Diana Stewart showcased some of the Hoops and Yo-Yo work and Jingle's work. So uh, uh, we're continuing to blaze trails uh, and still trying to have that agility uh, that's uncommon with a corporation our size. Thank you, Jamie. Bruce? Um, well, I mean, I guess my entry or story into the field of storytelling. Um, I mean, as a kid, I'm sure a lot of people, you made your own little stories, you, whether it was recording horrible, like Saturday Night Live skits on tape <laughs> or making your own films. My brother was uh, always shooting things on eight millimeter films and I was recruited to hold lights and things like that. So I was exposed <laughs> to that at a very young age. Um, and when I was probably 10, my father bought a Apple II and within a year, I had the cover off and was pulling chips out of it and doing things like in programming. So that kind of led me into this uh, more computer-based field. And uh, in college, I uh, studied computers, chemical engineering, architectural engineering, architecture, uh, basic design, then philosophy and a couple of lost years there. Uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, then painting and finally in industrial design, which in a weird way was not something I would recommend, but I think was a really, I learned everything I chose to learn at that each, with each of the seven years. Um, and uh, at the end of that, a friend of mine in Topeka, working for WIBW, uh, found the video toaster when New Tech was still based in Topeka. And we 
pooled our money and bought one and just taught ourselves computer graphics. Mm -hmm. And out of that, I moved to Los Angeles, uh, began working on television shows uh, like Star Trek, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, um, some feature film work, and uh, you know, was really in the process of, of uh, you know, fulfilling other people's visions. Um, and uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of that, my, a friend of mine, uh, we decided to try and make something on our own. And we made a short film called 405 that really became a very early um, viral sensation. This was about 2000. And uh, that opened so many doors. It was like you're saying with your letterpress video. Um, the things you do for free, somebody, somebody mentioned that earlier of how do you monetize that? Uh, you don't, but you monetize everything after that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, from that point, I was able to kind of, uh, after having worked for others and finding out how things worked, uh, kind of move off on my own and be, have that, what you termed entrepreneurial spirit and uh, uh, built a company in Los Angeles uh, and kind of had always wanted to move back here and uh, I sold my wife on the city and we came back and, and uh, began working here. That's great. I love these stories. They all have an element of a developmental curve that you all had to go through. You know, you probably started in different directions. I'd like you to talk a little bit about what were some of the most challenging training and development elements of that journey. Where, what, you know, we probably have a lot of people here who are on the front end of their journeys into digital storytelling. What did you find as some of the most challenging pieces of that process? Uh, it's just uh, keeping up with it. That's probably the, the biggest challenge. I've heard it's funny with storytelling. Uh, storytelling is uh, uh, probably very traditional. Uh, when you hear storytelling, you think of uh, maybe your grandparents or stories that you've heard that are very sacred to you. But when you put the word digital in front of it, suddenly it takes on a, uh, a little bit of an Object, odd juxtaposition of technology with something that's very traditional. Um, the technological piece, the digital piece, the software piece of uh, keeping up with industry standards, staying competitive, I had mentioned that earlier. Uh, that word organic is very, uh, applies very, very, uh, is very significant to how you need to be th thinking how you need to be uh, recreating yourself and looking for the next learning and training opportunity. So you hear a lot of organic and uh, natural and genuine and transparency and, and the, the things that are very make that digital and technical piece uh, very, very valuable. That's been the biggest challenge. Uh, as an individual, um, I've moved beyond the, the state of actually doing a lot of the work, but I have incredible team, incredible team of designers, of uh, uh, developers, of uh, uh, production people who I see their biggest challenge is uh, keeping up and keeping that expertise level going. And it's an ongoing passion, as I mentioned earlier, that you really have to stay on top of. Um, as Just as they learn something or become an expert on something, next thing you know, there's something new, there's something more efficient, there's a new process that they have to really quickly adapt to uh, in order to uh, uh, be playable in an arena that is all about, for the corporate side anyway, uh, making money, that revenue piece. Uh, I started out in television, um, shooting on Betacam and uh, doing a documentary program on 41 called Kansas City Crossroads, and uh, right after school, I graduated from UMKC, and so uh, there were certain decisions I made uh, after that in terms of where I went. Um, if a company had a technology that I had never used, like at the time, you know, there was a company here who had a uh, Sony F900, which was the camera that they shot the prequel Star Wars movies on, and I quit a job that I'd only had for a month and moved over to this other company so that I could hang out of a helicopter and shoot on this camera. And, you know what I mean? And so um, there's a lot of chasing technology, um, which trying to keep up with camera technology and imaging technology, it really, it, it's all fine and well, but the, the, the biggest thing for me has always been getting out of my own way as a storyteller, just organically. So 
Um, the digital stuff and the, the tools that you use, you have to know how to use those tools and you have to be a master of your craft before you can become an artist. Um, but uh, the, it's that spark, that little spark of a soul that you, have to have, that you have to get out of your own way in order to, to know how to tell the story. And then it, at that point, it's find, pick, the, pick the right brush, you know, pick the right tool and tell the story based on what the, you know, what the story needs. So, um, and I'm continually doing that. It's a very zen thing. It's like, uh, you know, I know that I know nothing. I know it's like, you know, I, I, I like the style that I tell stories in, but I always know that there's infinitely more skills and infinitely more um, uh, methods to deliver a story or create a character or, you know, whatever. So for me, it's just getting out of my own way. I'm probably kind of a more of a throwback in terms of keeping up with specific technology. Um, um, if I had the choice of honing my craft in, you know, Photoshop CS4 or buying CS6, I would rather spend more time honing my craft unless there's something specific that software does. Um, and I kind of, I constantly resist the upgrades and the, 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 the uh, adoption of new, radically different software. Um, and maybe it's the fear of an old dog and new tricks thing a little bit. I'll totally, totally cop to that. Um, but I think there's something to, uh, the, the tool is the tool. And the tool is important, but the artist is more important. And if the artist can still do uh, something that other artists can't do with a one or two version version older piece of software, I don't, I don't find any problem with that whatsoever. But uh, to counterpoint that, um, I do try and let my employees and my team adopt other pieces of software as kind of a, a hothouse uh, Darwinistic approach to just see if, if there are uh, other approaches. And social media, uh, just keeping up with what friends at other companies are working on, if, if uh, a certain a uh, piece of software starts spreading to, from studio to studio, there's probably something to it, and you probably need to pay attention to it. Great, thank you for that. Um, well, there are a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners in the audience, and uh, you all, as I mentioned earlier, have kind of different paths that you've taken, but for many of you, it's still about finding the work that will lead to the monetization part, or even finding the work that's for the self, uh, uh, the self-pleasing part of your work. How, how, what, how is it to, what, how, what, explain the process about how you go about getting the work. And I know it'll probably be a little bit different for you in the corporation, Jamie, but. Um, uh, uh, on the previous panel, um, they mentioned that uh, there's some discussion about marketing and, and the work is the marketing, um, the work the work itself generally uh, draws the, ne the, 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 the next work. Uh, I've been very lucky in that most of the clients that I work for um, are clients I've continued to work for um, based in Los Angeles for my time there. And uh, that work has spread to other clients. A lot of the work we do now for Fringe are for, is for an effects supervisor and producer that I didn't know when I lived in Los Angeles. There's kind of a, 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 a several steps removed of working on a show being successful, not letting them down, uh, and uh, proving that you know we're trustworthy with, with telling their piece of the story, um, and that the fact that we're not around the corner in Los Angeles uh, uh, wouldn't be a problem. When I decided to move here, we'd been working on uh, Star Trek Enterprise for about a year and a half, and our offices were in Santa Monica, and Star Trek was based at Paramount in Hollywood, and it occurred to me I hadn't seen them in a year. They'd never come by. So what point did it, wh wh what did it matter where we were? Uh, so, you know, I considered actually possibly moving out of Los Angeles and not telling anybody, because they might not have ever found out. Um, but, uh, but I did, and, and there was definitely a large drop off of work until we were trusted with a little bit of work at a time and proved that, you know, if something was wrong, we would, we would be proactive on that and not just stop answering the phone. How about you, Tony? Um, I think to echo kind of what Bruce is saying, I think that the things that you do for yourself 
uh, have to be your calling card and they have to be your marketing thing. So if you've got a story that you want to tell, you have a film you want to make or um, whatever, you know, be it what it may, um, you need to do that and you need to get it seen by as many people as you can. And um, like I said, you know, with the hammer press thing, it's brought me a lot of work and it's just, was just this thing that I just did on a lark. And, um, but even then, you know, doing, uh, I, I do music videos a lot, um, but I only do them for people I'm friends with um, and people whose music I love um, because uh, I don't see it as me doing someone a favor. I see it as me doing a project that's Mile Deep Films project. So your music video is not me doing you a solid. It's, you know, you letting me use your piece of music to create a piece of experimental film that I can then go out and, you know, put up on online and, you know, whatever, or having a film festival. And then, you know, um, word of mouth. It's really word of mouth. Like, most of my business comes that way. I don't, I don't cold call. I don't, uh, I don't beat the bushes a whole lot. You know, and I'm, I've, the past couple of years have been amazing. And, um, but I will say that, you know, one of the things that I love doing is um, nonprofit documentary work, because documentary has been such a huge part of what, uh, what I do. And I love doing these really altruistic, heartfelt, deep storytelling that really kind of connects with people and can do some good and, and raise money for a charity or whatever. And, and it tends to be, um, that, that is actually something that I am actively trying to figure out how to market specifically to that. And so for me, it's, it's a matter of just um, strategizing ways to get my work that I've already done in front of other in front of the people that need to see it. So. And when it's compelling, it will bring the business at some right. point. Yeah. That's great, Jamie. What's it like in a corporation? Is it different? Oh yeah, it's really different. <laughs> um, really different, but uh, very much alike. Our, uh, my uh, media mint team. We have these discussions all the time, and uh, you know, hearing Bruce and, and Tony is, is like one of the team members. We have a culture in, at Hallmark where we're very visual. So it really helps to, you know, use an old school term, mock it up, do a prototype, do a visual, do, do something that you can carry around and you can point to, you get, you know, showcase that can become your signature piece. Now, sometimes it's a signature piece that re represents your st uh, team's capabilities. Or sometimes it's an individual who, who discovers a technique, a method using a software that could be a great idea for a Hallmark product because it looks like this, it can do this. It's much more powerful when you act, actually uh, show that and, in a sense, walk that around to various clients within Hallmark. If I was working on my own, I'd do the same thing for client, with clients, potential clients in the city. So we kind of have to have that same mentality of, uh, you know, uh, representing what our capabilities are and what the potential is, but then really packaging it up with, because it, it can be successful as a product, it can be a potential, uh, bring uh, a positive impact to the bottom line, uh, what's our return on investment, all of those things have to be part of our dialogue when we present um, ideas and concepts. Um, so. Our audience within Hallmark is still as critical and as demanding, and uh, we we still really within within our, our own team and our own capabilities are still looking for what can be first to market, what can be our signature piece as a brand with digital storytelling. Thank you, Jamie. Well, you've been asking some terrific questions, and I'm sure with uh, what you've heard so far in this panel, that you may have a few questions before we break for lunch. So. I was just sucking up, and um, I, I, you know, I had, um, God, I hope she's not here. I had a, um, uh, it was a documentary that I did for a nonprofit, and, um, you know, when, in the initial meetings, um, she, you know, she said, oh, I love this piece of music by this band, and so I went to a stock library, and I found a piece of music that sounded, I mean, I called the stock library and said, find me a piece of music that sounds like this band. And, um, and she said, I want it to feel like this, and it should go like this, and that there should be no real like solid story arc. It should all feel like these snapshots, da, da, which is really way outside my style of storytelling, which is very linear and very um, 
not linear necessarily, but it's very narrative. And it, it, with documentary especially, I try to find narrative stories. And uh, so I, you know, I, she came by the edit suite and I was like, all right, you know, I, this is, you know, I'm working on it for a while and I, you know, kind of hit the go button. And she kind of sat there just with her legs crossed and, you know, it finished and there was just silence. And this doesn't happen very often, but total silence and she was just like, well, <laughs> and I mean, that was it. And it was like, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but so, you know, we had this conversation, but it was very open. It's like, I, you just try to be very open and you try to say, hey, look, here, from my perspective, I, my ultimate goal is that you get the most effective thing for you. Um, and so how do we go from here? Like it clearly failed. It wasn't, it wasn't right. It wasn't, but we had shot everything to make it right. So um, I just, the way that she asked me to put it, put it together was not terribly effective. Um, and so we sat there together and she was one of those clients that, you know, you have uh, clients that know so much about the process that they're amazing because they can go two frames that way, go, and then you, you're like, oh, God, you're amazing. That's, that was perfect. And then you have people that don't know anything and it's all magic to them. I love those people. <laughs> and, then, um, and then you have the people who know just enough to piss you off. And like, <laughs> you know, and so she, and I love her, she's a dear friend. Uh, but she's that, she's that client. I actually had that conversation with her recently. And I said, look, the next time we do something together, you're in it from, like, you are you got skin in the game from beginning to end. Like, you're there with me the whole time. So we sat there for two days and recut the thing, and it ended up being one of my favorite pieces that I've done because she let me tell the story my way. She had her input, which was really fantastic once she actually got into the storytelling. But I think you just, on some level, if it's client work, you put your tail between your legs and you figure it out and you... You know, unless they're just totally wrong, in which case you, you have the right to fire a client and say, you know what, you're just dead wrong, this piece is amazing, and <laughs> this is what you paid me to do, and you're not coming up with more budget to build more house, you're just asking me to build more house, and, and um, this is exactly what I pitched, this is exactly what you, bu you, you paid for, and you know, whatever, so, but I, I tend to try to not ever get, get to that point, but <laughs> Bruce never fails. No, that's not true. Um, uh, in television, there's not a lot of time to get things wrong because you have an air date, and um, there's an art to uh, the becoming aware of when something is not working early and having time to fix it. And uh, that's usually that's a best case scenario when you and the client agree something's wrong, and you can also kind of agree which direction you should go because once you choose to go left or right, you're never going to have a chance to turn the other way. Um, the other problem is the other thing when something goes wrong is when you think you done something awesome, which is what Tony was talking about, and they say, well, this isn't quite what we're looking for, and the, the house analogy is valid with visual effects, you really start build, digging a foundation and putting up, putting up studs, and if in the 11th hour someone comes and says, well, I was looking for a split level, not a, <laughs> not a two story, you've kind of got a problem, and you've got to kind of, there's really not much you can do, it becomes a very, very delicate dance, and then you you don't watch it when it airs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Hallmark is, uh, man, what a creative infrastructure they have. There's not too many companies like Hallmark that have, uh, there's companies that have in-house agency models, but Hallmark has a very interesting creative world within its corporation because the halls uh, firmly believe that is our brand's competitive edge. It's what we're known for. Those centers of excellence, the craft of what we do, how we represent our uh, product uh, is known widely because of the, the creative spirit there. So we have illustration center of excellence. So you have the illustrators who have their easels, all their paints, and then they have their Mac sitting right by their easels <laughs> because everything gets scanned in. Everything is manipulated. Everything's uh, uh, individual. They, they paint specifically for their digital output. So you'll see a lot of the illustrators uh, painting separate pieces, painting full paintings. Uh, I was just talking to one of my designers who's doing a book design. She's, uh, we use this term, we probably overuse this term at Hallmark, hybrid. She's an illustrator. She's, a, she's an animator. She's a lettering artist. She does sound work and music. And these are people who, they didn't go to school to do all those things, they just have gained all those capabilities and insights uh, working in the industry or working at Hallmark. But she painted her imagery 
scanned it in the computer, and then basically took it all apart in the computer. So as you've shown me her file that had, you know, 20 plus layers uh, that she can then use in various ways. Uh, the same is true with our lettering artists, with our writers. They still do the core traditional uh, uh, piece of, of what their passion is, but then they also modify it so it can be leveraged in a lot of the different uh, digital storytelling, either products or methods. So yeah, that's very much exists there at Hallmark. Yeah. Well, thank you for those questions. Uh, I thought the panel did a great job, and I'd like to show your appreciation for this. <laughs>